Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And uh, once again, we have Ashish with us. And for those of you who are here for the first time, you obviously have uh, missed uh, two parts of a conversation with Ashish. So I really urge you to go and uh, listen to the first part where he talks about his journey. And second part is all about Ashish, the writer, and we talk about uh, his works and his thoughts, and also not just the published work for whom the links are there in the below this podcast, but a uh, whole lot of uh, his writing is generally available in public domain in the print, largely, and uh, hopefully we'll also see Ashish compile them and bring that out as a book. And uh, today we are having Ashish once again to talk about his perspective on future for our Future Fast edition. Ashish, welcome to Future Fast once again, and thank you so much for uh, being with us. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ananjuda, for having me here. Pleasure. Well, uh, what do you think? What's your take on future? What's your perspective on future? Uh, this, uh, at one level, is a very frightening question because uh, most pundits have been proved wrong when they tried to uh, forecast uh, the future. Uh, so uh, we can talk about the trends and what the trends point towards. Uh, to give you a simple example, when uh, think about it, when uh, mobile phone came into being, into Indian lives, yeah, uh, I don't know if any mobile company or phone company ever thought that in so quick a time, all they would advertise is how good a camera it is. <laughs> True. True. Yeah. So uh, this transformation where uh, the first mobile phone said how good you can talk, how clearly you can listen here to how good a video you can take. You know, uh, so uh, it and it happened so quickly uh, yeah, in true. India. Yeah, was could that be forecasted? I don't know. I asked this question. There's a favorite company of mine, uh, Nanjunda, uh, and I asked uh, one of the IIM uh, professors that why you don't teach. Uh, your uh, most of your case studies is not from this company. And that's one of my favorite companies is Nokia. Did Nokia ever think that it'll happen to them? What happened to them? You know? Uh, so it's a very dangerous uh, question. Uh, Nanyuda, you have asked me to give a forecast. <clears throat> a couple of things uh, <clears throat> that have come is, uh, one is definitely artificial intelligence. No. Yesterday, I uh, was in a online uh, discussion on artificial consciousness, and this discussion was uh, actually initiated by the, there's a fantastic institute in Bangalore called NIAS National Institute of uh, National Advanced Studies. Uh, NIAS uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies. It is just behind Indian Institute of Science and I think it is kind of part of Indian Institute of Science and they are into social studies. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I have attended a couple of lectures over there very at a very what you call exalted level of lecture they have. Okay. Um, very high end intellectually. And uh, they had people from US, uh, from uh, Singapore, from I think UK, from India. Uh, and uh, one or two of them were talking of uh, artificial consciousness. And they were trying to find what is consciousness. So we really don't know. I came to know of this term yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, consciousness, uh, talk about consciousness has been largely a spiritual domain. <laughs> yes, yes. And and they were bringing aspects. Of, and But this was, they were talking of technology. They were talking of both spiritual part and the technology part of it. 
Okay. So, uh, and the lady spoke about the research she does in this particular field. Okay. And she's from hardcore technology area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, there would be a lot of integration of these thoughts and concepts. Uh, which of these concepts would fall by the wayside and which of these concepts uh, would catch up? Uh, it's very difficult to predict. It's very hard to predict, okay? Uh, because we don't know what the future is. Uh, really there. But then uh, my own interest has been uh, in the past uh, couple of years is how uh, humans interact with machines, processes and systems. Okay, It came from a very innocuous uh, discipline of what you call UX, user experience design. But uh, reading about user experience design and because I am into, you know, we do design uh, mobile applications and uh, uh, mobile application is, uh, is a place where you actually are trying to see how the user is going to, you know, use. And I have designed mobile application for users, vast array of users who have never used a smartphone. Okay, to create a smartphone app and to perceive how they are going to use it without, mind you, a uh, uh, training session because you can't train people on user apps anymore. People, okay, either they get it or they don't get it. If they don't get it, which means your app is to be blamed, not they. Right. Okay. Right. It so essentially needs to be um, needs intuitive. To be so obvious, so obvious right. and intuitive. So now I, you know what I remember the first lesson on design for me, my understanding, personal mm -hmm. understanding of user interface was uh, mm -hmm. I had read about the launch of uh, iPod mm -hmm. and uh, it was not yet in India. And mm -hmm. uh, I was waiting outside a client's office because he had a visitor. And uh, at the same time, a sales guy walked in and he sat next to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 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 I think uh, uh, the uh, his uh, secretary was someone, I think it was just about the office hour was ending. So she was stepping out. She said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't think you can see him. Uh, it's already uh, his time is over and uh, he's waiting to meet him. And uh, I'm sorry, there won't be any time for you to meet him. He said, and he said, see, I don't mind. I just have one minute work. I just have to tell him something. So I'll just wait. Uh, and he looked at me and said, if you don't mind. I said, it's okay. And she said, okay, fine. And he said, sir, just a few more minutes. And after that, you can go in. And I need to be leaving. And she left. And the, this sales guy who walked in had a box. And I asked him, uh, is that iPod? It looked like it. Apple logo was there. And he said, yes, I won a Best Sales Award. And this is the box. And I said, so how was the experience? He said, oh, I don't know. It's all in Chinese. You know, they got it from Singapore. So I don't know what to do. I'm anyway taking it home. He said, I said, can I try it? Because what I remember saying was that uh, Steve Jobs, I, I, I used to follow Steve Jobs. I guess a lot of us of those days used to follow him. So the launch of it and wherein he said that anybody should be able to use it within three seconds. I said, uh, that's what he said, so can I try it? He, he asked me, try it as in you understand Chinese. You know, I opened it all in Chinese. I said, uh, can I try it? Because he said, anybody should be able to try it, use it in three seconds, so let me give it a try. And believe me, Ashish, I could change the settings to English in three seconds without being able to read. The three. It was all uh, uh, Chinese or whatever, the settings were for Singapore. And uh, that was when it kind of blew my mind, that user experience part, that it uh, literally could get it on. Yeah. I'm so happy, uh, Nanjunda, that you spoke about iPod because I've, I have written about uh, 
Jonathan Ive. Jonathan I V E. I V Y. You call it I V or I V? I V. I V. I V. Joe, Joe I V. I have written about him. Okay. Uh, because he was picked up from uh, a corner of Apple by Steve Jobs and given the, uh, you know, uh, this project yeah. of creating. Yeah. And uh, it was he. And uh, the brief was that experience over functionality. Okay. So it has to deliver fantastic experience. Okay. You can cut down on functionality. Okay. Right. Because technology is always there is a compromise, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's good that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was my first lesson. Uh, and, I mean, I, I became yeah. a student of and, that. And yeah. You know what? Uh, sometimes we get enamored with technology, and uh, there is another lady called Mariam, Mariam Mohit. Now, <clears throat> this is the story of Mariam Mohit. She ran uh, an online bookstore, okay, in in Palo Alto, I think, and. Uh, she got a message from somebody, call from somebody. He said that you run a bookstore online. Okay, we also are into similar areas, but I think uh, there are certain things that you can bring on the table better. And there are certain things I can bring on the table better. So why don't we have a call, a talk? Uh, we can meet in a cafe. So Mariam meets this gentleman in a cafe. And, and this is from Mariam's own uh, a deliberation. She says, after the meeting, I text a friend of mine that I met a funny guy today. Okay, he has a company with an even funnier name called Amazon. His name is Bezos, and he offered me a job. Okay, so Mariam became a <clears throat> employee of Amazon when Amazon had less than 20 people. And she was the, what you call the VP user experience. And one of the lessons that I learned from her, Maria, was that when she was testing her brief to the designers in Amazon was Amazon was still essentially a bookseller then, okay, was that a lady having a dial-up 56 kbps line in Nairobi should be able to order on Amazon website. Okay, now Look at the way she thought. She did not think of bringing the best, biggest technology, this or that. She said she went straight to the user. She defined the user, a housewife in Nairobi, having a dial-up 56 kbps line. We all in our lifetime have gone through that. <laughs> so we know. <laughs> yeah, uh, many in yeah. today's audience won't know what is KBPS. It's yeah. kilobytes per second. <laughs> yeah, but that lies in the success of Amazon. Uh, you know, finally, uh, uh, Ashish, in two thousand, I started an e-commerce business. Okay, and uh, I used to uh, very seriously tell people I'll teach Jeff Bezos. Uh -huh. what e-commerce can do because Amazon was selling only books and I started here in Bangalore too. <laughs> so it, it, it yeah. sounds like a joke literally today. But So when, you know, my my in my even A, sometimes I had uh, situations where I said, sometimes I participate in uh, uh, product development or project development, but my participation is very limited to I wear the a user's hat and talk to the developer because the developers know development better than me. Okay, I can't. Yeah, but I is the user's hat. I said, what if this happens? I said, no, sir, that is such an old technology, sir. 
okay who uses that technology okay so these kind of conflicts i i know i understand so i give this example of amazon where amazon picked up the lowest denominator okay the most difficult a and try to build a system for her okay and if it works for her it will work for anybody else that was the assumption and that 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 works it is so that realization is there has to come where uh, and i see in future a lot of integration happening and especially integration from as i see happening already in psychology because from user experience uh, went to uh, uh what you call behavioral economics right. to evolutionary psychology and i find those fascinating subjects you know and more and more we are into this space more and more we actually need to understand psychology and consciousness and those kind of terms would come into technology lingo yeah uh <clears throat> so uh, how how how's... how scary or how uh, uh, optimistic are you about future from these aspects uh you know because uh, both, you know I'm, there are there are very big names who are uh, talking very threateningly about ai right that it could yeah. destroy yeah. and uh, uh, i i for one uh, uh, i'm a pro ai if you will right i'm i'm mm-hmm. uh, i'm part of a foundation where we are talking about uh, how do we prepare a ai first generation so uh, in that respect so what's your take where do you stand uh see uh, it's kind of a uh, what do you call in germany it's zeitgeist uh, an, an idea whose time has come you just can't stop it you like it don't like it love it hate it you can't stop it correct okay so let's face it first that's the first data point okay it's there and it's going to be there right okay. now the point is uh, what are you going to do with it how is it what are its limitations uh, some people are asking uh, the question <clears throat> and it's a relevant question maybe is that why do you call it artificial intelligence when it is basically mixing and matching already uh available intelligence so artificial intelligence can create a mixture of da vinci and monet okay uh and reno but can artificial intelligence create another da vinci who is completely different from everything else okay uh that's a question maybe not today maybe tomorrow we may okay we don't know okay but having said that uh many of the things specially its application in delivering healthcare is is an area i see where we can tremendously use artificial intelligence tremendously yeah and that would be very good for the society yeah if you can through artificial intelligence do both prognosis and diagnosis early on uh, uh i see tremendous future uh, in life science <clears throat> uh in this area because i have dabbled a little bit uh, nanjuda in the healthcare domain uh in the sense that uh, we have a a product which is uh in the pharmaceutical area and the area that we work is uh, uh compliance regulatory compliance so okay. so uh so i have gone through a bit of uh, that area okay i learned both the manufacturing part of healthcare which is pharmaceuticals and uh, equipments and uh, all those things and also the service area which is actually healthcare delivery which you do in 
diagnostic centers, hospitals, clinics, etc., and doctors. So I see a lot of opportunity there. Oh, great. Now, yes. now any tool, Nanyunda, is uh, uh, amoral. This is my belief. Is amoral. A tool is amoral. A tool doesn't have uh, moral dimensions. Right. People using the tool have moral dimensions. Exactly. Like I say, yeah. the knife, you can cut an apple or yeah. a person. <laughs> exactly. 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 So, uh, <clears throat> my take would be somewhere, there would be uh, uh, hazardous applications, bound to be. Okay. You don't ban knives just because people knife another person. Okay. Uh, but there can be and there would be very beneficial applications. Yeah, and healthcare see, yeah. is one area I see a lot of potential. See, I, I always refer to this. There are more people uh, killed because of road accidents than guns. Yeah. But That's guns are right, prohibited, right. not right. automobiles. No, not automobiles, yeah. That's true. So, And a lot of synthesis from life science artificial intelligence, human psychology, uh, a lot of integration in that area uh, I see happen. What would be the products and services? Uh, I cannot guess. Okay. Uh, but I see a lot of things happening in that area. Yeah, And that's a very interesting area. How how do you uh, see? You're also a writer, right? Uh, uh, how how do you see uh, 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 the writer, a professional writer, career uh, in the in the new days? Because you know, uh, I have a friend who actually published a complete book uh, yeah. with AI. So I think there are many people doing it. There are people uh, generating uh, full film scripts out of AI. I, in fact, uh, for a talk, uh, I, I also uh, uh, trying to be a futurist. So uh, I had my first gig as a speaker in one of these talks to talk about the future, and I made five videos completely generated out of AI too. Uh, so you you actually can generate full videos, scripts, uh, a blog. It's that easy to generate blogs. Uh, so how do you see? Uh, writers uh, relevant in this future plain and simple answer is i don't know okay uh, <clears throat> whether writing as a profession would largely wipe out the way uh, uh, pages wiped out when mobile phones came in yeah would that, that would uh, happen or uh, there would be some areas of writing which would be largely taken over by AI. Okay. Uh, for instance, technical writing, quite possible. Okay. Um, mind you, a huge number of people today are involved in technical writing. Right? Yeah, globally. Uh, <clears throat> creative writing. I don't know. I wouldn't know whether uh, people will be able to differentiate, frankly speaking, I have not seen any one of these kind of writings, creative writings of AI. So I wouldn't know people will be able to differentiate between something which has been uh, AI generated writing and uh, human generated writing, if I can call it uh, that. Okay, uh, Whether there would be any difference there wouldn't know. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is an area, uh, is a very fuzzy area. As oh, well, uh, there were popular stories mm -hmm. of uh, creative writer, content writers losing their job, copywriters losing their job yeah. because agencies yeah. have decided to go with the thing. So, uh, I, I, I do, uh, I do see, in fact, uh, we are able to generate a lot of uh, things. In fact, uh, my colleague tells me that uh, uh, you just give me a few pointers. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll develop the full 
not. So I don't. I'm asked. I don't have to be writing blogs for my company. They say just give pointers. We Points. will generate the rest this, of it. Yeah. So that's that's quite possible. That's quite possible. Is happening yeah. that it's, regular stuff. Okay, blog. Okay, blogs and other things uh, may very well be generated. You give the but points. Do you do you the see that uh, as a threat, or do you see that uh, uh, as a part of the evolution, and something else will come about in that? Uh, frankly speaking, I don't know. I I am not ashamed to say I don't know, <laughs> because most of the things in life I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so uh, but I would not hazard a guess. Ki that is likely to happen but there are you know we have seen in the course of time because you and me we perhaps come from a generation where we have seen the backlight telephone uh, okay and we see today so we have seen the entire uh, shift yeah and we have seen professions that were not there earlier and we could never think of those professions right and they have come about so uh, uh, again, looking at history, uh, one thing is certain uh, that the future is uncertain. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and we can't predict. We can predict one thing is that we can't predict the future. Mm. That is something I can predict. Yeah, looking at uh, yeah, right. Past, yeah. See, uh, given uh, coming as a. Uh, writer, entrepreneur, uh, traveled. One of the uh, few people who uh, travels so excellent. I mean, you enjoy traveling as well. So, if you were to, if you were to share, you know, uh, to prepare for the future, how do you tell people to prepare for the future? What, how, what can one do to prepare for this uncertainty? Uh, one of the things you know, uh, Nanyunda, uh, while I, I don't remember what, when I was reading about usability, user experience and other things, was that what do human beings like, okay, fundamentally like, which are almost genetic in their character, okay, and there a human being likes to interact with another human being. And this characteristic has evolved what we call in evolutionary psychology. You know, this characteristic has evolved over, I don't know, 50,000 years to 2 lakh years, 200,000 years or so. Okay. Uh, human beings are herd animals. Okay. They live in communities. So in whichever way we are, wherever way we are, we create our own community. Okay. You can be in uh, US, okay, in California, and then you become a part of California, uh, Karnataka, Acharana uh, Samiti. Okay. Uh, or you be part of an Indian this you be part of that. Okay, you be... So, all this come from, mind you, the evolutionary process which took about 100,000 years. Okay. And that says that human beings love to A with another human beings. At some point of time, you, you wish that you are interacting with a human rather than a machine. And uh, there are many occasions where, where I have felt that uh, this is too machine A. Very interesting, a friend of mine with whom uh, I discuss a lot, you know, <clears throat> he is uh, <clears throat> into, he uh, is a corporate trainer. And he was relating an experience, okay, that he went in Bangalore. He went to a place and uh, at the point of entry, there was access control. And they said, uh, 
what is your name, your age, your phone number. It doesn't feature in our list of uh, visitors over there. So, you know, uh, we can't let you enter the building. You can't let you enter the building. Okay. Then he had to come out, make some phone calls or something. Oh, yeah, 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 you are there. I have given. Don't worry, I'm, I'll come down and get you. So he came down. The first thing he had to do is he was to incorporate the name in that particular thing. So then the gates opened. He went in and they said, your training is in this room. Okay, so I'll take you. So they went to the training room. The training room door wouldn't open. <clears throat> Okay. Then uh, found a training room door wouldn't open. Oh, because we actually uh, had the train scheduled at 9.30. Okay. So, somehow or other, they opened the training room. But believe me, and this is Bangalore, and this is today's scenario. The lights wouldn't come on in the training room. Because it's scheduled to come on at 9.30. Okay. So, uh, and he has, uh, in fact, related this story. And this is today's story. In perhaps a building which they think is a very futuristic building we have created. And a futuristic system we have created. Uh, you know. Uh, so, this is also <laughs> another side of reality. Yeah. Uh, so somewhere you are, you human beings have this innate, absolutely innate uh, uh, characteristic that you, in distress, you find another human being, you say, ah, he's going to help me. Uh, yeah. so he loves another human being. Okay. Uh, that is there. Human being likes nature. Okay. You can simulate nature a little bit, but still human beings like nature. Means you love, you would love trees, you would love flowers, you would love this. And these are not aesthetic part. These are, I think, evolutionary part. And you can, uh, <clears throat> you know, poo-poo anything, but you can't poo-poo your evolution because you got your genes from there. And this is going to remain the same. You know, uh, somebody said uh, a very fine example is uh, I remember when I was in school, when the first uh, digital watch came in. Okay? And everybody said, now this old tick, 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 tick watch is going to go. Everybody would go digital watch. Okay. <laughs> what happened? Everybody got digital watch, but the digital watch is actually simulating the tick, 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 tick. Because our brain evolved over 100,000 years to relate to analogously, okay, to time. Uh, that is not going to change in another 100 years. The, our hands, the shape of our hands and roughly you know, the size of our hands are not going to change in the next 500 years. Probably a few thousand years. Yeah. Probably, I, yeah, few thousand years. Unless, no, I'm keeping that option of genetically controlled human beings. <laughs> like GM food, you have GM people. Oh, yeah. oh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the bionic space is changing, right? So people, uh, uh, people are actually uh, uh, prosthetic are no longer made for people to walk or uh, traditionally what it was used, right? Mm -hmm. Today, prosthetics are made for the specific purpose. If yeah. you want your legs for running or okay. playing a particular game. Game, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, or even to climb uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as a climber. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so prosthetics are also made specifically for the function and not a general purpose. A general uh, purpose things, yeah. So, so, so I would so it's possible, those yeah. What you say can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these things are already there in play. So, yeah. So, uh, so, 
So you were to make some prediction. I know you said you don't want to make a prediction, but probably uh, draw some indication. So how would what would you want to t- talk about? What would be life uh, in two hundred years hence? I, I think yeah, five I years, know. fifty years, whatever, any time. Fifty years hence, fifty years, okay. timeline, fifty years hence. Okay. Yeah, uh, we would uh, have a lot of uh, gadgets, of course. Okay. Uh, uh, one, one, one small uh, thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I've been uh, lucky to have uh, a few uh, transhumanists in this podcast. I've also okay. had uh, one of the uh, leading uh, 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 faces of longevity. Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Okay. So, uh, so I urge the listeners' audience to look them up. So, uh, just trying to borrow from those conversations. So, do you see, uh, uh, perhaps we could have this conversation after fifty years? After fifty years, uh, I think our conversation would definitely change. No. Yeah. But we being yeah. there. Oh, after fifty years, whether uh, we would be there or not, I don't know. Uh, there are two issues here. One is whether we can be there after fifty years, whether we want to be there after fifty years, and third element is uh, whether if we don't want, is there a way to get out of a <laughs> for fifty years? So all these questions. Uh, oh, well, uh, transhumanists say that we will live for thousand years, and yeah. uh, uh, Aubrey's argument is not necessarily as transhumanist, but the idea is to that there is a possibility scientifically that we can live very healthily for long years. So his argument is more about longevity from a point of being healthy, while transhumanists about living for thousand living years, almost for thousand years. Uh, yeah. longevity definitely yes because we have seen that trend because there's not something new you know uh, it's not very long when you had the average life expectancy was 30 35 and uh, at 50 somebody was called, oh, 50 years old okay and uh, today at 70 75 i mean people are quite active Dreaming of doing this, dreaming of doing that, etc. So that process can be exponentially developed, okay, uh, to uh, I don't know, 100, 150 years, quite possible. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that is definitely possible. Uh, no, yeah. one thing, and, uh, I mean, generally, uh, you know, I find it uh, most Indians are wary of the thought of longevity, but uh, uh, from a point of our own upbringing in the, all those mythologies, I mean, Krishna lived for 220 odd years. Uh, so there are a whole lot of stories of people having lived for hundreds of years. So, uh, uh, and uh, why is it that we, we, we are stuck to the recent past of uh, uh, lifespan was X? Why and it is now currently 69 and 72 in rural and urban, and uh, people in our circle who are past that are all in bonus years. So wh- wh- why is it that uh, we Indians have become? Or is it that we are becoming less imaginative? Or uh, what is? I it? think this is. I think this is a dosage of the English education that we have received uh, throughout <laughs> because. I don't go as far back as Krishna. I take uh, there's a uh, there's a saint called Trilanga Swami, Trilanga Swami, in Banaras. Okay, he was during the British period, mind you. Okay, and so his life was pretty documented from British A because he had a, some tiff with the law British uh, law in Varanasi because he used to roam about naked in Varanasi. Okay, and many a times uh, that the cops hold him inside uh, the jail or the police station, and uh, he would uh, just come out and uh, roam again on Banaras. Okay, now if I go by his account, which is documented account, 
okay he lived for at least 150 to 250 years documented documented absolutely documented okay yeah. he is called tailanga swami because when he came to banaras uh he came from the Tel tilanga region which is now you call telangana okay right. that's why right. he got that name tailanga swami and even uh sri ramakrishna visited banaras varanasi and he went to see tailanga swami so, so again, this is Ramakrishna, around early 1900 late 1800 uh, no late 1800 1800 story Okay. Yeah, 1800 story. Okay, but 1800 is British India. Yeah, sure. so Correct. Correct. and it's documented. Okay, so Thailanda Swami and uh, Sram, uh, Sir Ramakrishna, when he saw, they talked in sign languages between Ramakrishna and Thailanda Swami. And this is what Ramakrishna had to say that I have seen Chalta Pirta Shiva. I mean, he is a walking Shiva. And that is how he regarded the Langa Swami. Okay. Uh, and uh, so he lived for that. And uh, there are many stories about, first, you may believe the story, you may not believe the story. But you can't uh, deny the, the years that he actually lived. Okay. So what, I mean, you're saying 150 years. So what is the last record of him I, I don't know. I have to look up. I have his uh, biography. Oh, there is a biography. In, okay. uh, I have, no, no. I have, read, I, have, I have read him not only in his biography. Uh, Sir Ramakrishna's article, if you read Ramakrishna, you will find him. If you read many of the other people who wrote about the Shias, the saints of India, they have written about him. Okay. Okay. Uh, so... His uh, disciples were there. They wrote about him. Okay, his disciple, one disciple lady, and she said Babaji would get into the Ganges because Ganges was his mother, Tailanga Swami's mother. Okay, so he would go into Ganges and come up after hours. He would remain there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, I... Uh, have seen this human capability, okay, of what we think is unnatural or uh, uh, whatever it is. We have these human capabilities are possible, and India uh, so, is so, a land uh, of infinite possibilities. You so know, it always is, been. It uh, is kind of possible yeah. after fifty years we could possibly have this so, kind of a conversation. So quite, yeah, yeah, and you do believe it's possible. Yeah, it's, it, and it's, not, it's possible. Not being part of a man. So maybe I think transhumanism will grow in India then at this rate. No, there are people today and who can bring things sitting in front of you who can pick up something from the Himalayas and give it to you here. Okay. Have and you met such? I have seen or I have listened and I have a I have met some people there's one story uh, in this particular book Mauni uh, Baba this, uh, Mauni Baba story uh, Mauni Baba doesn't do magic okay uh, but then uh, there are characters like that and it, Himalaya is uh, is a place you know you know, people ask me, where do you love to travel? And I said, ask my wife. And my wife says, this fellow wants to go to Himalayas any day. So I have a bias for Himalaya. <laughs> and uh, I read about Himalayas. And I have read, uh, read very authentic, you know, writings on Himalayan sages and Himalayan shears. And Himal Himalaya is a place we have no idea about what Okay. Uh, wisdom uh, is there. Yeah. How, how do you how do you see the sense of spirituality fifty years from now? Then hmm. spirituality fifty years from now, I'm pretty confident is going to be there. I mean, how how, how, this, how I mean, if you so. see spirituality is a human being's innate question about why 
why why me why this okay why that and people ask me people when people say science it does not uh, or or maybe i'll just that. change that question yeah. maybe yeah. not about <laughs> spirituality but about uh, uh, the superhuman uh, yogic babas and those things in the himalaya and all that okay okay uh, was einstein superhuman no one he was extraordinarily brilliant but why why don't we call him superhuman i mean uh, see einstein's faculty was extremely sharp in certain areas hmm. okay uh, but just because it's in the field of science it's in the field of this okay we call it brilliant but we don't call him superhuman okay if somebody else we can't explain we call it superhuman <clears throat> i'll give you a very interesting example uh, nanjunda <clears throat> there's a conversation that happened and there are letters documented letters uh between swami vivekananda and nikola tesla okay now when vivekananda went to us he found out that there is a person called tesla who was doing experiments to find out this relationship and interchangeability interpolability between matter and energy okay and vivekananda was very excited mind you uh, he didn't say oh we we know that already he didn't say that he said i want to meet this person i want to interact with him and he told tesla that look in our ancient texts they say that all matter is a manifestation of energy but that's what the text says but we don't have a scientific proof of it okay. if i would be very interested in your science okay to give an explanation and proof how this thing happen or what is the scientific relationship oh is and there a work Vivekana, is this the published work uh, of conversation it is with, there uh, this is documented this is documented oh, okay, the letters okay. between vivekananda and nikola tesla is documented okay okay, uh, okay. Uh, okay now when he came back he kept on writing tesla okay, okay. that how far how well Uh, unfortunate vivekananda passed away in 1902 okay and tesla did not uh, was not uh, successful in uh, bringing in it is in 1905 3 years after vivekananda's passing away another gentleman this time albert einstein published his special theory of relativity 1905 and then he published a series of papers till 1914 and 1915 where it became the general theory of relativity and we get this famous e is equal to mc square relationship right. where he right. gives the relationship between matter and energy okay so uh, why i say this is because uh, uh in india so how did these guys who wrote vedanta and other people uh, talk about uh, the thing that every matter is a manifestation of energy okay how did these guys know they they were only quoting out of what they have studied or do you I think they know. they I were experimentative uh, perhaps my this is my intuition and i can't prove it is there are other ways of gathering knowledge <clears throat> uh, and studying experimenting is not the only way and vivekananda was very clear he was very clear about we need to study we need to experiment okay uh, but we also realize that there are other ways of knowing things <clears throat> and doing things look at the great seers of india okay 
Ramakrishna, for instance, okay, uh, he he could hardly sign his name. He could hardly sign his name, but he could quote scriptures like anything. Okay, uh, where where did he get this from? Okay. Uh, so, and he is the example because of Vivekananda, we know a lot about Ramakrishna. There are several other people, okay, who are there, okay. And uh, I, I know we are getting into the realm of spirituality, okay. But then there's a story, interesting story from Ramakrishna's life that once he was going along with many of the other sadhus, she has yogis, yogis. He was going and it was night, dark and through a forest and they couldn't see a thing because it was uh, a, new, uh, a new moonlight. And uh, it was so dark. Then one of the yogis, what he did was he was wearing a, a vest. So he opened up his vest like this and there was yoti, you know, yoti light. Okay from him, which lightened the place. Okay. And the story goes that Ramakrishna says that look, in your journey, spiritual journey of yoga, you would attain a lot of capability. Okay. But these capabilities can also waylaid you from your ultimate goal of moksha or Godhead or whatever you call it. So don't do that. Don't show magic. Okay. You have the power. You know, which we in Indian term we call Siddha. Okay. You attend the Siddhi. Okay. We say that uh, in Indian thought Hanumanji was the Ashta Siddha. He had all the eight Siddhis which even Ram did not have. Hanuman was a complete Siddha. Okay. But you would hardly find in his life uh, he did something which is part of that except we have this flying with the Ganda Madan and uh, apart from that. Okay. but So there are innumerable accounts and I have read through and very credible sources which say that you attain power have you heard of somebody called Babaji Nagraj? No. Okay. Babaji Nagraj is, he is also called uh, by other names. Uh, they say that he is still there in uh, the Himalayas. He is still oh, that in the Himalayas. Babaji uh, uh, quoted in those uh, uh, Himalayan masters. And all correct, that. correct, correct, correct. Oh, that Nagraj, I didn't know what he is. Okay, Babaji. no, no he's sometimes called Nagraj, but he's called Babaji. Okay. Oh, yeah, Babaji. So, there is a person called uh, Shamacharan, Shamacharan Lahiri. So Shamacharan uh, used to uh, work. Yeah, there is the to, to, So yeah. Shamacharan uh, used to work uh, in, I think, one of the uh, railway companies in construction areas. He was there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, he went. So in his life uh, story. This is the autobiography of a yogi, right? No, autobiography of a yogi is talks about all these. Uh, all these uh, talks of yeah. all these. Autobiography of a yogi is written by uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. Yogananda. Yogananda's okay. teacher was Sri Yukteswar. Huh. Sri he Yukteswar's was a disciple of teacher. Uh, uh, yeah, Shyamacharan Lahiri. Shyamacharan Lahiri was a disciple of Babaji. So hmm. that's the lineage. Okay. Right. So. You have innumerable stories. Samachalan Lahiri's story, his own story, is uh, he used to work in the British company, that uh, railroad company or wherever. And his boss uh, was very uh, uh, you know, morose. And he asked his boss what happened. And he said, my wife uh, is very sick. I got a letter from my wife. And... Uh, I don't know. And in those days, you know, sickness, whether you die, you don't die, we don't know. And then the next day, Samacharan Lahiri comes and says, don't worry, Sahib, your wife is fine, she will be fine. 
So the, he said that, okay, here is a fellow who is giving me solace. Years later, when the wife comes to India to visit and the wife asks, who is this man? So he is one of the employees. But then when I was sick, this fellow went to me and met me in England. She yeah, says, yeah. okay, so uh, there are, first of all, definitely I'm convinced there are ways to um, acquire knowledge than the conventional term way that we are used to studying. Studying definitely is a way. So definitely hopefully in the next 50 years, uh, this becomes more a common practice? I wouldn't know that because uh, if that were so, you know, uh, meditation, which is so uh, powerful a technique, uh, okay, would have been uh, more pervasive, actually. But has it become very pervasive? I don't know. No, in uh, terms of percentage, see, maybe, has maybe it really in India, on? not many, but today, world over, people talk about meditation. So obviously, yeah, it has become people, more. People talk about it. Let's talk about the percentage. So there is a tipping point, you know. Have we reached that tipping point or we are far away from that tipping point where we can say that this generation is very meditative? I don't know. Okay. So, yeah. Because so what has happened You think is world and humanity will be more uh, caring or more destructive? In the 50 years. Both. Both. See, Both? Uh, see we, we have been caring, we have been destructive all along the history of humans. And, uh, <laughs> I think the history yeah. largely suggests that we have become more and more caring, right? We have. Beg uh, your pardon? History suggests that we have become more caring, right? We have. Uh, we've, uh, I mean, there are that few cannibals now. There were types of cannibals. And there were so many destructive wars only to be show who's more powerful. So today, I think uh, people are becoming more thinner and thinner by the day. So, at least historically uh, speaking. Possibly, possibly. Tell me one thing, Nanjanda. Uh, 30 years before, 35 years before, if you are riding a scooter, okay, and... Uh, on a deserted road, you find a fellow waving at you. Okay, uh, 30, 35 years, you take him in the scooter. I said, I want to go there. You take him in a scooter and go. Today, you are driving in a car and in a deserted place and a fellow waves at you. I want to drive. Uh, how comfortable or will you or will you not stop? Take him in your car and take it. So I don't know. Uh, you see, if you, uh, it, it's like you know, in a way, it's like light. I I, I sometimes find a light as a great uh, example. If you ask light, light, are you a wave? Let me try it out. What is the answer you get? Is life is a wave? You ask light, 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 are you a particle? Let me try you out with experiments. What answer you get? You get, yes, I'm a particle. Okay. So whatever you try to find, you will find it. If you want to find uh, passion, uh, compassion, you will find compassion. If you try to find indifference, you will find indifference. Okay. So both are there. Okay. Uh, uh, so we don't really know. Uh, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, life is going to be. But perhaps as, uh, I think it was uh, Tom Peters who wrote, uh, uh, one of the early management gurus who wrote a book. And uh, he said, uh, human beings uh, haven't changed a whit since Plato documented it 2,500 years ago. We in India, we can say human beings haven't changed a whit since Mahabharata took place. 5,000 years ago. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. I, I think uh, this is yeah. a, a most uh, 
unique uh, future conversation I've had where we <laughs> spoke. I, mean, we, I think it went even up to Mahabharat. So. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Ashish. Uh, My pleasure. My pleasure. Making some pleasure. very, yeah. very, very interesting yeah. uh, perspectives. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm sure uh, our audience and listeners will also find it uh, as interesting as I did. Uh, and uh, please go ahead, feel free to share it with uh, all the people. And uh, for those of you who have missed the earlier part, now I don't even have to say you will you surely go and uh, look them up. And for those who have not yet subscribed to uh, Future Path, time to click on the subscription button now. And Ashish, once again, thank you. And before thank we you. close, uh, all the listeners and audience, please look up the links are given right below. Uh, Ashish uh, has uh, published a recent book, but and also the other work that he has done. And this is a recent one, Gandhi and the London uh, mm-hmm. Cabbie. Yeah, so uh, go look it up. It's 10 short stories. Very easy read and very engaging as well. It's, when I say Thank easy, so don't much. think it's just a light read. Uh, there's a lot to take home. And uh, it's basically his personal experiences as stories, so beautifully told and in a very simple uh, language as well. So I'm sure you will enjoy it. And also makes a great uh, gift for those who want to, who enjoy uh, nonfiction. And at the same time, who wants something really engaging, this is what it is. And thank that, you so thank much. You again. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. And Namaskar to you, all your audience. Thank you so much. It has been a real pleasure, Naminda, to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.